I have insurance and so I don't need to focus on anything else other than just my physical well-being because a bike is completely replaceable and the fact that you have insurance and that you're protected and you're covered all you need to do is focus on yourself and getting yourself better like I'm gonna try and I'm gonna take risks and I'm gonna take chances because why else why would you not right I'm Alicia Speak I'm 37 I'm a full-time lawyer but I'm also a cyclist for Cycle Team London Recently retired from cycling after an illustrious career and better known for his immensely loyal support of teammates throughout his career. But as well as being a loyal and respected domestique, one of the most respected domestiques in pro cycling, he's also one very big as well. You know who's coming up next. It is Mr. Matt Heyman. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, Matt. Take, take a pew. Here we go. Well, when we say win big, it's obviously Paris-Roubaix, as, yeah. as we know. But we'll talk a little bit about Paris-Roubaix later, because obviously the theme of the Rula Classic this year is the Grand Tours. And you've, at last count, ridden 11 Grand Tours. Um, your first was in 2002? I think so. Yeah, 2002. Yeah. Let's, say two, let's say 2002. I spent a bit of time on the train yesterday looking up some of the old results. They kind of blur. Um, you kind of try and block some of them out. So I think it was 2002 probably. Uh, it was uh, the Giro. Yeah. And what was, what was that first Grand Tour like for you? Because obviously debutant in a Grand Tour is, is big for any rider, but how... How was the experience? For yeah, you? going into the unknown, I think uh, you see now any, any young rider um, having to go and not know what's going to happen and how your body's going to react and, and, and backing up day after day. And, um, you know, it wasn't, Grand Tour was not my forte, not really my thing. Um, and, and in such a long career, only doing 11 mean that I, I missed out on a few years. Um, which probably also helps me having, you know, I'm a bigger guy. It's, it's pretty daunting going into a Grand Tour, especially uh, something like the Giro with so much climbing. But, uh, yeah, so pretty scary. Um, and, yeah, I think it, my first Volta too was, was ridiculously fast. I think it was one of the first years that they really shortened the stages in the Volta. Okay. And, um, yeah, I remember second rest day lying on my bed knowing that I had to go for a training ride with the guys and just looking at the ceiling, thinking they can't make me start another stage, but uh, I made it to the finish. Yeah. Did you, was there any point, because it was for me when I was riding, um, a few times where you just questioned your own sanity about becoming a professional bike rider? Because it, there's some pretty dark places you go to. Oh, with fatigue, but, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and physical, especially. And you forget what you're doing and you forget yeah. where you are. Um, I, I distinctly remember once in the, in the Giro, um, we had a rest day after a mountain stage and, and the next day having a massage and I'm watching the TV and they were showing the day before stage and the mountaintop finish and thousands of people and I thought, oh, that looks pretty cool. And I was actually there the day before, but I wasn't soaking it up. I wasn't enjoying it. I was yeah. in my own little you know, tunnel of pain trying to get to the finish line to, ta to make time cut to start again the next day. So I definitely tried to in my last few years to, to look around and, and, and kind of enjoy it, even if if I wasn't in it. And I, and I used that definitely in the last couple of Tour de France's. I, I used that um, in those kind of dark moments that you talk about when, you, when you're really just trying to make time cut, um, to look around and, and try and enjoy the crowd and, and use that as a bit of motivation. And the, and the sport, you know, you, you turned pro, wow, back in 2000, 2001, is a long, long time yeah, ago, wasn't it? 2000. Uh, yeah, it's changed, changed immensely. Yeah. And the way that the Grand Tours are ridden has changed immensely. So from your first experience of riding the, the Giro, right the way through to yeah. a more structured approach. And the, the, the first Tour de France you rode was 2015, wasn't it? Which is uh, 20, yeah, 2014 that started 2014. here in Yorkshire. Yeah. So what, what's, what's the most notable change that you've seen? As a oh, rider? it would have been good to bring back uh, Mario Cipollini who just told people we're not racing <laughs> the, the today. The patron, it's You're the patron, yeah. Helmet bopping people and saying, right, first two climbs, we're going to take it easy. And then all you guys can race all your hearts out. But... This group is just going to go to the finish line, and, and it definitely was it was a different way of racing, and that just doesn't happen anymore. And um, you know, every now and again, there's there's been those lead riders that kind of come back, but the racing's changed. Um, the the f the level of the riders is 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 higher across the board. Uh, it, it's hard to say that they're all better riders, or it's just different. Um, you know, we used to have group heddos. We definitely had that. We we had those long stages in the Giro where where we look after each other, um, and that seems to be a bit out of fashion at the moment. So you just, 
but the level of all the riders is, is higher. Everybody, you go up a climb and everybody's doing 400 watts and you look around, no one's dropped. And, and Scary. So, yeah, it, it, and that's come with the change in training. And, and, uh, but, yeah, I say bring back Chippo. That was pretty, pretty good when, <laughs> when he came to the front of the bunch and said, look, first two mountains we're going over, nobody's racing. And uh, we've got all the sprinters on the front. And, you know, if they're going to throw a 230k mountain stage at us, then, then he said, OK, you guys can race from there. It, it, the thing is, it, it, it literally, that was what it was like, because my only juror was 2000, and yeah. Cipollini <coughs> was the patron. Yeah. And he would make the call. Yeah. And if the racing got too hard, he would, he would you know, he would basically stop the racing. And it, yeah. it, was, it was something, I mean, it was, there's only, I think of Bernardino was kind of similar. Maybe, didn't really have, I mean, Fabian Cancellari was here yesterday, would like to think of himself of a patron, but didn't quite have the same influence. Yeah, there's he? people, I mean, even Bernie Eisel, I mean, he yeah. looks out and he's there, the one, they're, they're the guys that will go to the commissaires and go to the race organiser and, and say, hey, look, the riders are, are not enjoying this part of the race or this is too dangerous or we need to change things and, and try and negotiate. So they're still around, but it's not the same as, as back then. But, uh, you know, the sport's evolved in so many ways and, and, and even the training, talking about the training that we used to do back then to, to what we do now, is it harder or is it, is it easier? It's just different. Yeah. It's, it's not that one was harder and, you know, we used to just, when I first turned pro, it would be 1,000K weeks, um, whatever that is in miles and, and just long training and, and that was hard. And now there's a lot less volume but you're on top of a mountain and you're not eating and you're doing intervals every day until you break down. So it's just different ways of getting to the, to, to the end result and which was harder, which was better. Yeah, I mean, I, I, when I first turned pro and I, I rang up Sean Yates, um, he's my direct sportif. Didn't ask for a training program, I hope. I, I asked for... <laughs> I asked, for, I asked, what do I do? Because I've been ride, riding internationally, but domestically primarily. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we're looking at re maybe riding a Grand Tour, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, what do I do? And he said, just stick another two hours on your training ride. And again, yeah. they go really hard at the end. <laughs> and then, the folk, then the f I thought he'd cut the line. And it was just silence. Mm -hmm. I said, anything else? He just said, no. Yeah. no. And, and it was one of the shortest conversations I've had with him. <laughs> but it literally was just get the miles in. So yeah. I did. I, I kind of upped the volume by a third. But I don't know whether, I mean, I went okay. But, uh, yeah. but since, since then, things have changed dramatically. It's so much oh. more focused and structured. Yeah, look, if, if you can't turn up to a Grand Tour these days without having been at altitude training camp, pretty much, yeah. um, you're not coming in with the traditional racing. You used to race all, all of the classics um, and then maybe do a little five-day stage race in Germany and then ship yourself off to the Giro. I mean, that's not happening now. People aren't doing that. Um, it's a lot more structured. Um, and, yeah, it's... The attitude, the, the number of race days has been reduced significantly. Yep. Um, when I first turned pro, we were racing 80 or 100 days a year. Um, and we heard last night some of the guys talking about, you know, Sean Yates racing 130 days a year. Um, that was only another 10 years before that. Um, and now it's down to 60 or 70 days. But then what's harder? The guys are on the top of a mountain, they're training, they're preparing, and those races are becoming more important. And, and that's why every time you do turn up from day one in these Grand Tours, it's, it's so important because there's only 21 days to get out and you're not racing as, as much anymore. So, so with that in mind then, and you, you reflected fondly on Cipollini keeping the racing <laughs> controlled, are you, do you look back on a particular part of your career that you like more than another or did you just enjoy that, the fact that it just changed and evolved? Or do you think, well, yeah, that was easier, that was harder? less racing miles, but arguably more intense a year for you in terms of structure and focus yeah. and, and dedication, sacrifice as well. Yeah, look, even though the, the hours have been reduced, I think probably mentally it's been harder the last the years and, and training to that level. I think me moving from rubber bank to sky was, um, I really did enjoy that, that scientific way of looking at things and, and a bit of a revolution in the sport. Yeah. Um, and it was nice to be a part of that from, from day one. Um, I'd got a bit stagnant. I was a domestic at, at, at Rabo. Nothing more was expected of me. I was just going to the races and getting on and doing my job, and it was fine. I was getting paid, but it was that was that was probably a big move for me, and 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 it you know rejuvenated my career a lot. I think um, gave me you know new goals. There was a bit more of a belief in my ability, and and from there, I um, after a few years with them, and then realizing I wasn't going to make the Tour de France with Sky and also coming in a few situations in, in the classics where we were pretty, pretty uh, strong with Boas and Hagen and Stannard and yep. Fletcher and myself and you know, not really getting the opportunities there, I decided to move across to um, what was Orica Greenidge. Yep. Um, and yeah, so 
uh, I think that was, you know, Sky did, you know, really change, change the way we trained and, and from then on it became a lot more uh, intense. Did, did that kind of shift, because we all know that Sky, you know, did revolutionise. I mean, they, they weren't particularly popular in the first couple of years no. in terms of certain things that they did, the no. approach to the public and stuff. But in terms yeah. of training, was it a bit of a culture shock for you? Did, or did you, like, embrace it quite quickly? No, or, well, was there, or was there a period of, like, adaptation that you well, had to kind of readjust? I think um, it was probably more so I came from from Australian background and, and, and we kind of grown up with that institutions of uh, getting East German coaches to track it, to train our team's pursuiters. And, and that's kind of where, where the English system came from. Yeah. Um, so when I went to, to Rabobank, I was actually surprised at how kind of traditional everything was, how unscientific everything was, how, you know, you still heard about when I was pro that the, the French teams would just be bringing their own cordial to races or syrup, or I don't know what, what you call it here, but uh, to fill their own bottles. I mean, people weren't using sports drinks and, and things like that. Yeah. And we're talking mid-2000s. Um, Yet, back in Australia, when I was a junior, training for junior world championships, I was getting lactate tests and I was... I was so it, when I came to Sky, I, I saw that all back again right, and, okay. and I was ready to embrace it. It wasn't as foreign as maybe some of the other riders, so I was like, of course, this, is, this has been out there, we yeah. just haven't been using it yeah. um, in a traditional team like Rabobank, which has now eventually transformed to Jumbo Visma, which is obviously <laughs> yeah. caught up on that, that front. No, definitely. So, just going back to the tours, for a bit, and look at like eleven tours as we've as we've touched on. What was the tour? Okay, let, let's let's start. What was the hardest tour for you, or the hardest Grand Tour, whether it's the Tour, or the, the World Tour, or the Giro? Which which sticks in your mind as being utterly brutal, and why? Yeah, look, uh, it has to be 2014 Tour de okay. France. So yeah, I moved moved from Sky to to uh, Green Edge to 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 go well in the classics and also to ride the Tour. And I got a start in that Tour de France that started here in Yorkshire. Amazing crowds for the first few days. And, uh, you know, it was unbelievable. And, it, and the Tour was bigger and better than anything I'd ever, you know, been involved in any other race I'd done. And I'd wait, what was 15 years into my career to even get a start in the Tour. So I was finally there. And then uh, stage 10 from Mulhouse to uh, La Plage de Belfi. Uh, it was only a short stage, the first... Uh, the next day was a rest day, and I just I'd had a pretty tough day the day before in 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 the you know semi mountainous stage, and I was I was wasn't feeling great, and I was with a bit of trepidation going into the stage, and I just had nothing. Right. And uh, I got dropped on the first climb, came back in the descent, got back onto the peloton. It was starting to rain a bit. Got dropped on the second climb, and that was the last time I saw anybody. And actually, I might have run into Contador. I think he broke his leg, and he was still going better than me. Um, <laughs> He got up and I think he passed me at one stage with a broken God, yeah. leg. Um, I remember that day now. Yeah. So, look, I was on a pretty bad day. Um, and I soldiered on and I had, I had a director behind me and a mechanic that just watched me for three hours just slowly die a painful death. And it was, it was, it was a pretty harrowing experience, actually. Yeah. And uh, I had to pull numbers off and get in the car. Yeah, because we chatted a little bit about it yeah. before we came on stage, you know. I'm getting emotional. Just no, 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 no. It, yeah. it is. It's powerful. I waited 15 you know. years to get to the Tour of France. Yeah, and yeah, because you, you see, they, and they are quite harrowing images when we see. Like, I think it was the best example of this year was Thibaut Pino. Yeah. You know, uh, having to pull over after arguably being the biggest threat to to Bernal and to Geraint. And yeah. He had to, and he had to quit, and the guy yeah. was in tears, but was trying to ride on and ride on. There's only so far you can go, but yeah. but you learn a lot about yourself, don't you? You know, yeah. At that time, you're kind of consumed by it all, yeah. but, uh, and it, it takes a little, little bit of time to let go, but and you, you know, this is five or six years ago, and it's still, it's still there. Yeah, no, so, I mean, I, 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 can, I, I remember that moment, and, and I just clicked out, and, I've, and as soon as that bike went on the roof of the car, there's yeah. no... Yeah, no turning back. That's it. You've put your foot in the car, and you're out, and it was done. Yeah. And maybe in hindsight, it would have been nice to just ride to the finish line, but I couldn't face the press. I couldn't see anybody. I didn't want to see anybody. Yeah. I just wanted to crawl away into a hole. And, uh, and I did for a while, and it took a while to come back from that. So yeah. um, that was 2014. And in 2016, I came back and at 38, 36 maybe, finished my first Tour de France and rode down the Champs-Élysées. There we go. That's, yeah, yeah. The, high, the highs and the lows, that's, that is the essence of the beauty of cycling, isn't it? Yeah. You, you can only really you know, celebrate and enjoy when you've actually 
been in a, in a bad place, I think, because there's so much sacrifice. Yeah. But uh, that, that must have been amazing, you know, in... in uh, yeah, no, it was... It, it, oh, um, I, I remember pulling onto the Champs-Élysées and they, you know, the jets fly over the top and we've all seen the, the footage on television and I'd been there actually as a junior, I'd broken my... or amateur, I'd broken my collarbone, I'd taken a bus from Holland at four o'clock in the morning to go down to Paris and watch the Champs-Élysées right. with my father. And, um, you know, we, we stood there for hours up near the Arc de Triomphe, 10 back, could barely see anything, yeah. got on a bus, drove all the way back to Holland that night and, and I was just like, Fuck, next time I'll be on the other side of the fence, thinking that it would be, you know, in three or four years and yeah. I'd be winning stages of the Tour de France. I was a bit more cocky then. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but it took me almost 20 years yeah. and I remember pulling up and, and seeing Jerry Ryan as the, the sponsor of the team and, and, you know, it was pretty emotional to, to ride up you know, it's an iconic, iconic piece of road up to the. Arguably the most Triumph. iconic in cycling, isn't yeah. it? Really. Well, I don't know. There's Ma maybe, velodrome maybe the somewhere. velodrome. Sorry. <laughs> Arguably. <laughs> Arguably. No, I mean, it's so, so. So, what about the most, aside from your own su success in the in the grand finishing of the yeah. 2016 tour? What's been the most enjoyable tour for you, um, in terms of success from the team or teammates? Yeah, look, just, just like a quite a joyful, yeah. the most joyful tour. Well, which which probably also led into, into that win at Roubaix is the 2015 Vuelta. Yeah. So we went there with uh, Simon Gerrans, Daryl Limpy. Um, as an older group, they'd crashed out of the tour, hadn't had a lot of racing, came back. Um, oh, and then we had, you know, Esteban Chavez and Caleb Ewan yep. as the young guns. And that was just, I don't know, we just all clicked and we had a great time and I was riding particularly well and um, Chavez came out, won two stages early on. We had the leader's jersey, and Caleb won his first stage of a Grand yeah. Tour. And, you know, I felt really a part of all of that, and I really enjoyed just, you know, these two young guys coming onto the scene and, um, and also spending time with those older guys who have become really good friends. So that was, yeah, probably one of my most enjoyable. And I wasn't suffering in the mountains. No. <laughs> so. The thing is, that, that within a team, it, success kind of breeds success, and it kind of fosters and nurtures this kind of really positive atmosphere, doesn't it? And it's quite... People think... Really? And it, it, it's, it's the case though, isn't it? Well, I, you know, I look back and I think about all the, the great times I've had in racing and when I start to list them, there's one thing that comes through and it's that we won. Yeah. I mean, there was, it, it's, it sounds, you know, like, I don't know, maybe there were, I was having good times, but when I look back and I really pick out a, a trip that I went on and, and another one that springs to mind um, was with Daryl Impey. We went over and won a race in Canada and then we came out with Gero and won Quebec and Montreal. And yeah. In a week, we just won everything, and we cleaned up, and we were clicking as a group. But it, that that thing is just winning, yeah. and and that's what you're in it for. And even though I wasn't personally winning in any of those, but I was very passionate about winning yeah. races. But I mean, that's it. You were doing your job, and and when you, what's what I want you to kind of get across, and it's it's not so much in relation to Grand Tours or as such, but as primarily you've been a you know a domestique for the yeah. vast majority of your career because you're very good at it. Yeah. So what does it take for you to, or explain to the, to the audience here how much more, how much deeper you can go for somebody else than yourself? Because it's a different sort of feeling. Your, your oh. finish line quite often could be 50K from the finish, could be 20K from the finish. So your whole psychological approach yeah. is very different. You can literally just empty yourself till you almost... Yeah, a, g a good one with that. Um, to give you, it's, it's really hard then to switch back to riding for yourself. Um, right. And often you see that with the lead-out men and the sprinters. Um, when you see that that somebody can position themselves at exactly the right point as a lead-out man every single day, yeah. but then given the opportunity to go for themselves, they just don't go. So I had the ability to be able to just, I knew, I hate losing. Sometimes I was more disappointed when we lost than the guy that actually should right. have lost the race, but yeah. I felt like we lost, and especially if I didn't do my job particularly well. Um, and for, like you said, there is no actual finish line for the domestic. Is it? 200 metres to go, is at 5k to go, yeah. you've got to make those decisions and from what you've done you've got to draw, because you're not always winning or very rarely personally winning, you've got to say well I did my job well today and yeah. have to be satisfied with that. So yeah, it's, it's a different mindset and, and, it's, and that's also where you get those winners, those Caleb Ewans, those, those uh, Simon Gerrans, that their only focus is, is the finish line. Um, and then you get those other guys that are super at, at helping out but they don't want that pressure and I was... Right. Probably most of the time, one of those guys. I really enjoyed working for those guys, but I, when given the opportunity for myself, I often backed out a bit. But I'd ride through a brick wall for someone else. Right. 
fair enough. We'll Talking about bricks, cobbles. <laughs> we know we're going to get onto it because we kind of, you know, I know it's the grand tour. We can't have Matt Heeman on stage and not talk about Paris Roubaix. So let's go back to the 2015 Vuelta. He came out of that, and, and a lot of riders now, a lot of teams, the, the Vuelta, not so much in terms of its prestige, but its position on the calendar, yeah. can really be advanta- advanta- advantageous, if I can get my words out, yeah. in relation to form in the early part of the following year. So clearly, yeah. do you think that kind of helped? But then, but then you had your injury. Yeah. So all of that was almost kind of undone. Yeah, looking back, I mean, it's all in hindsight. You go and, and you get that result and then you try and, and look back and what you did. But, yeah, I think the Vuelta does help that. Yeah. Um, you know, look, I'd, I'd had some good results and I'd been a couple of top tens in Roubaix going in and, you know, every year my focus was on that. That was the one race that I really put my hand up for um, as far as the classics. Skent Weavergum a little bit, but, you know, Flanders I felt was, was too hard. But Roubaix, you know, a couple of top tens and I was definitely... You know, I'd sit in the bus and say, guys, I, I want to have a good crack at this. Um, so I went away after the Volta, went back to Australia, trained up a storm, um, probably too much. Went to South Africa, did altitude training camp, because that's what you have to do these days. Yep. I was absolutely flying, and then I crashed in Het Newsblad, the first, the first race of the season, and, uh, yeah, fractured my, my arm and was in a cast and, and thought it was all gone. And, you know, uh, in hindsight... Maybe I was already at the top and peak form, having done all that work, the Vuelta and everything, and with getting on the home trainer and, and spending those days indoors. Um, I don't know why I was doing it, to be honest. But uh, You must have had some sort of burning belief that... You, was it, were you trying to just salvage a ride in the in, in it's a, it's Bay? Really or, or, what, or what was your thinking of it? Was it just kind of desperation, panic? No, I mean, I, I, um, I question that often. I would get off a session in the afternoon and I'd go into the, into the kitchen with my wife and open a beer and say, what the hell am I doing? Why do I just do a double ergo session? Um, so for people who don't kind of know, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're coming to listen, you're kind of aware that yeah. you, you obviously you're, you're on Zwift yeah. in the garage with your arm resting on a stepladder. Yes. Yes. Uh, like doing double yeah. sessions. Look, it's, much. you know, uh, you identify yourself as a cyclist and once that's taken away, you really don't have... You don't have anything, and, 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 and you see it with all the bike riders. As soon as they have a crash, they want to get up and get on their bike. And yeah. if, as long as you're riding, you're okay. You still have you an You feel identity. kind of whole again, you, don't yeah. you? Yeah. So the first thing you want to do is test. Even if you're going to get on, ride, and then get off for a while, you want to just make sure that I can still ride my bike. So originally, and I jumped on the home trainer, and I, I set it up, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do these sessions, and it'll all be good. And I looked at the brick wall, and I thought, 20 minutes went by, 21 minutes, 21 minutes and 15 seconds, and I got off. And then, yeah, I came across Swift, and, um, you know, in the early stages, you know, I didn't even have a, a smart trainer and, and um, pretty small screen. I've got, thanks to Eric, I've got a massive setup now, and, but, uh, you know, it made it a lot more interactive, and I was able to do sessions, and, and my coach was just surprised at, at the amount of work that I was getting through. Yeah. So I think it was a combination with having that great build-up and then doing that work, it was, it was double sessions, it was intervals, it was exactly what I needed, but I was missing some of that extra, and I just came into the race. Um, you know, I think by the time you get to Roubaix, a lot of the guys are pretty battle-weary from the classics. Yeah. It's a lot of mental, mental stress. stress. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. is a lot of mental stress, not just the physical side, and, and now something as uh, being, on the, you know, being retired, looking at the guys doing it, trying to work out how do we, how do we kind of manage that? Yeah. Um, because because I, I get it. I get that guys are just get to Roubaix and, and they're, they're sick of putting their body and their mind on and the line. And they know what's coming as well. They know uh, they're going to get a pounded. And <laughs> Fabian off Tom has just, you know, they've pounded you every week for the last three weeks. What's going to change now? And, yeah. and you kind of lose that. And I just came in with no expectations. And so actually, I'm going I'm to hold yeah. you there. So what, on the bus, before the start, Paris Roubaix, what was your, obviously, focus, that it's yeah, your yeah. kind of race, you've realised you've man- yeah. managed to keep some good shape. What were you thinking about that race? Were you thinking you were gonna, I'm, I'm going to win, or were you just thinking, I'm just going to ride the best I can? What, what, was, um, what, what were you thinking at that moment? For the first time in a number of years, I was very relaxed. Right. Because all the other years, it was like, okay, today it has to happen. This yeah. is my one day. This is what I've spent three, four months training for. Yeah. Uh, you know, my mum and my brother come over and watch and Roubaix, I love Roubaix, today it has to happen. And now the pressure was off. Okay. So I did said to the director the night before, I'll go in the breakaway just before the cobbles start, get up the road. And he's like, oh, I don't, don't know about that, but I did it anyway. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, my coach had emailed me the night before and said, look, you're, you are in really good shape. You should be confident. Um, so I 
learnt later than not to believe everything he said. But um, at that time, I took some. Uh, you know, he's always positive about everything. But uh, you know, the numbers were actually good. You know, it, it had been surprising. I'd raced the weekend before in Spain. Um, Trophy uh, Miguel in drain, and, and I'd done some really good 20 minute powers and five minute powers, and so you know, he's giving me feedback that you're actually in, in good form. But so, yeah, I was ready to race, but I told the team I want to have that kind of wild card, um, you know, role. But I'm enough of a teammate to realize, okay, I don't have the legs today, and I'm gonna sure. and I'm gonna help out either Luke Durbridge or or uh, Jens Kokole. So that's how I went into it, and um. Yeah, I mean, I got away in the breakaway and I had one teammate there, Magnus Court Nielsen, and he got dropped and, you know, the best guys came across, including Luke Durbridge. Yeah. And I thought, okay. And Luke said, hey, Matt, how are you going? And I'm like, yep, good, boom. I started attacked and he's like, well, what's going on here? And on the next section, uh, Sector uh, or She's, I think he had a puncher. So I was then in the front by myself and I was able to then just go back to riding for myself. And, and had Luke not had that puncher, you know, maybe I would have fallen back into that role, not knowing how far I could go in the it race. I kind of subconsciously thought. Yeah, you well, know, you know, he's, yeah. he's come across with the best six riders yeah. in the race, with Ian and with, with Tom and, and these guys. And, uh, you know, um, I've been out here in the breakaway. I'll help out my teammate. Um, but after he punched it, I went, OK, let's see how far I can go. And I just took it sector by sector. OK, we've got three minutes left. Oh. There's two questions I could ask. I'm just wondering, shall I ask you what, what you're doing what going forwards, or shall I ask you about the last couple of laps in the velodrome? Who wants to hear what? Velodrome, or what's he doing next? Velodrome. Right, okay, there we go. Right. It's a democracy. So, coming into the velodrome... So I'm a director sportif at uh, Mitchelton yeah. Scott. Um, <laughs> chief of special projects. I do some work with Pirelli. Uh, no. Um, no, look... Strangely, uh, I don't know if anybody else watches the 100 metre finals at the Olympics of the men and you think, what would it be like to stand on that start line? Yeah. And I've watched Perry Roubaix fi finishes and thought, what would it be like to be in that situation? You must be absolutely, this one child is shitting yourself, but <laughs> I wasn't. Right. Was Strangely, just I was just really calm right. and I was just doing what I thought you should do in that situation. Yeah. And I mean, I've worked with Steve Peters and, and, and sports psychologists and I was, in, I was in the zone. I was doing what, how I knew you were supposed to ride a final. So it didn't matter who these guys were. I, I was building in confidence and, um, you know, in hindsight, attacking over the top of Tom with, with 2K to go, probably um, I surprised myself. Yeah, you surprised um, me watching it. It was like, blimey. Uh, I think, <laughs> and I think <laughs> afterwards that was why Tom said to me, no, you you were better today. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realise that he was on the ropes as much as he was. And I dreamed about getting on the podium in, in Roubaix and, and I'd seen other guys, whether it was Magnus, uh, Baxted and, and, and all these other guys that had, had great rides in Roubaix and they weren't particular star riders um, perform and you always kept that, that, you know, that glimmer of maybe I can be on that podium one day. Yeah. But yet, I could have done a turn with Tom into the velodrome and just, and just been happy with second but Somewhere, you know, I swung up and I said no, and the other f guys, and we went into the bell with five, five riders, and um, I don't know, from my track days, if in doubt, lead out. So yeah. I hit out <laughs> way too early. <laughs> um, thought the track was shorter than it was, even though I'd been there 17 times before, 16 <laughs> times before. Didn't realise it was that far, and uh, after I hit out, I looked up and I saw 200 metres and thought, ooh, that's a long way. <laughs> um, and yeah, then I was just, uh, I remember looking underneath my arm and uh, they were coming but not, not quick enough and, uh, and, and, and all of that autopilot kind of switched off once I finished, once I crossed that finish line and, and then there's the, the scenes of me with a pretty disbelief uh, look on my face. And it was definitely of, kind of like shock on your face as you Yeah, I think I like know, a, came yeah. back to reality and, yeah. and how am I going to deal with this, so... That's, that's just brilliant. Well, thanks very much for sort of taking us through that again. We could relive it over and over and over. But unfortunately, we've run out of time. But ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for a wonderful guest, Mr. Matt Heyman. Thanks, nice Thank one, Matt. Thanks, really good, mate. Well, please...
please don't go away. We've got, we've got lots and lots of cool guests on. So next up is the Little Prince, Damiano Cunego, double winner of the Tour of Lombardy, of course, and winner of the Giro d'Italia. And he'll be chatting to Simon Rutherton. So please, don't go away. And thanks very much indeed. See you later.